Turn with me in your Bibles to um, Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. In the Pew Bible, it's page 971. Mark chapter 4. Uh, we'll read verses 1 to 20. Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 20. And as you turn, just hopefully you're familiar with this passage. Uh, it is one of the gospel accounts of Jesus well-known parable of the soils, or parable of the sower, or parable of the seed, however you want to remember it. Marvelous teachings here by the Lord Jesus Christ. He teaches his audience then and his audience now about how we're to receive the word of God when Christ speaks. Indeed, I've entitled today's sermon Um, hearing Jesus and in parentheses and why we don't. And so all of that and many more things are bound up in this great parable of the sower beginning with Mark chapter 4 and verse 1. Hear then the word of the Lord. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. And while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. The birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. When the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. Then Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Perfectly clear. But when he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parable. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, to his disciples, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? And then he goes on to explain it. The farmer sows the word. So people are like seed among, along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, They last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, Hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. That's the reading of God's word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Let us pray. Father, we're thankful that you have chosen that we would be here this morning gathered as the body of Christ to hear Christ speak to us. To hear Christ speak to us about Christ speaking to us from this parable spoken by Christ several thousand years ago. And now, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit given to us in Scripture, that we may understand its timeless teachings about hearing Christ today. Open our ears, our hearts, our understanding. We may gain from this teaching during this time and hear Christ speak to us through it. 
For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Over the years I've heard what amounts to people saying to me, uh, well, that, that sermon was uh, okay, or that sermon was not so good, or that sermon was fantastic. And I, I, I'm always, you know, at a loss to say when somebody makes any comment about your sermon because as a preacher, it's just a vehicle for bringing the word of Christ to his people. And how can that not always be wonderful? But we have factor in the human side of it that sermons are imperfect and preachers are imperfect and flawed and long-winded, not me, long-winded. And, and that sometimes, you know, humanly speaking, it's not the most exciting time of the week. We live in a multi-dimensional universe of multi-dimensional communications aimed at us 24 hours a day in high definition and converting to monologue in a building on a Sunday morning is quite a leap. And so it's important that we understand, I think, really what's going on here when we gather from week to week. And um, Jesus gets to the point of it here. But I want to, first of all, answer three questions that precede this that are part of why we're here this morning that probably don't need a lot of explanation. I mean, we all, I think, would hope to hear Jesus speak this morning. Now, if you think he's speaking to you in an audible voice, I can't debate that. I don't think that's legitimate. I don't know what's causing that. I don't want to throw water on it. But as Bible-believing Christians in the Protestant Reformed tradition, we don't normally uh, give much countenance to people who believe that Jesus speaks to them. There's a story about a Reformed pastor that I knew very well for years, and he had a, a member of his congregation come, and she came from a tradition in which Jesus speaks to people. And love the Lord, and obviously a Christian, wonderful woman. And, um, and so she came to her pastor, and this is absolutely bona fide, if you can believe the pastor told the story, but I, I can do that. He said, uh, she said, oh, pastor, Jesus spoke to me last night. And the pastor, being a reformed guy, looks at her and says, how do you know it was Jesus? And she said, he looked just like his picture. Think about that. She was completely sincere. Completely sincere. I don't know about you. I don't think there are any pictures of Jesus. Are there? From the first century? No paintings? No cameras? They've only been around for 175 years. No portraits. So it's a self-authenticating kind of experience that a person believes they have. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here is hearing Jesus in the ordinary way that he speaks to his people as he's at the right hand of God today and we are down here gathered as his body. Well, where does he speak? He speaks to his body, the church of Jesus Christ of which we are all members and grafted into Christ by his grace through the gospel and by the work of the Holy Spirit. He speaks to his body. He has a message for his body here, this part of his body in New Haven. He has a message for you. And every Sunday he has a message for you. Morning and evening he has a message for you. He's speaking to his body. When? Well, when that body is gathered for worship is when in particular he's speaking. That's why this is not just ordinary time. This is a special time. There might be a, a sign over the door. As we come in, I'm not suggesting that. So when I come back, don't put, please do not put up a sign. You know, caution, Jesus is about to speak because worship isn't a Bible study. It's not a conference. It's, it's not, you know, a little get together. Worship is us reaching out to the triune God as members of his body through Christ the head by the spirit, asking him to speak to us 
just as if he was here in our midst. So that we might hear his word roll off his lips as though we were standing there listening to him in person. And yes, how does he do that? He does that sadly through the likes of me. Your pastor, who's not as sad as I am, who's just men who were once sitting in the pew, like you, Christ came and says, I want you to prepare to speak for me. How do I do that? Well, you go to seminary and you learn the original languages, Hebrew and Greek, and learn Old Testament, New Testament introduction, and learn all the different aspects of theology and the differences in theology over the centuries. You learn church history and the history of theology. You immerse yourself in this time so that when you take this word that was inspired by the Holy Spirit for the purpose of Jesus speaking through it, you have some sense of what he might say if he was there. Because you want to be the mouthpiece of Christ during that time. He doesn't take sway of your personality and control your voice, now Jesus says. He uses you with all of your interesting traits, your education, your background, <laughs> your accent, your idioms. You know, it's just because he's going to blow by all of that and speak. Just an instrument. And it's a privilege to do that. It's a fearful privilege to do that. Because you say, well, who am I? I was just sitting in the pew a couple months ago or a couple years ago or a decade ago, and now I'm up here. That's how he's designed the body of Christ. And he would take members of the body and not send angels to speak for him, not come down and rematerialize, but just take a sinner saved by grace, prepare him, and then teach him over the years, hopefully, to be a little better at it. Honing his message so that it's the message that Christ would deliver. And so it's a fearful thing to speak for Christ, to be his ambassador, to be, in a proper sense of the word, his vicar, his, his substitute. And to have this word in hand and try to interpret this, this difficult book. It's not a simple book. But the main teachings of the book are fairly simple. And if you studied and learned it as a student, and you learn where it all comes from, you make a decision of whether you're going to be a Methodist or a Congregationalist or a Baptist or whether you're going to be Reformed. And once you hit that you know, kind of tradition, then you, you branch out and you understand the differences in that tradition, and that becomes your tradition because you think it reflects what you believe the scripture teaches and implies in terms of how we do church, how we do the body of Christ, and what we are to learn, what Christ is saying and should say and would say if he were standing here in our very midst. It's a very wonderful, special time to be gathered here. That's why we begin with the salutation because this is the church of Jesus Christ continuing throughout the ages, asking that the blessing, blessing of God fall upon us today that fell upon the apostolic church. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We hope, desire, earnestly desire to be that church, not because it's a special church, but because it's the church. We just want to be part of the body of Christ. And so it is that that's when, where, and how it takes place. You're a preacher handling the word of God. So Jesus speaks through this mouthpiece, not in still small voices. And over the course of years, as you submit yourself to preaching of different preachers and throughout the years, it's through that process that Christ helps you to come to him and embrace him with faith and begin living for him, suffering for him being persecuted for him, even dying for him. And if not, dying in the Lord Jesus Christ so you are assured of your eternal inheritance in Christ. And all the way, 
we hone our ear to the voice of Christ, but especially during this time. Well, Jesus teaches about all of that in this parable. It's, as I said, it's either called the parable of the sower or the parable of the seeds or the parable of the soils. Take your pick. It's all there. And it's very simply laid out in the first section in which Jesus lays out the actual parable before explaining it. There are four soils. There's the path where the sower walks and where other people would walk, which is, you know, trodden down, which is hard. It, it doesn't receive the seed. And if it were to receive the seed, it would quickly be taken away. It's impenetrable. It's a lot like the human heart before the Holy Spirit opens it up, before the Holy Spirit raises us from death to life and gives us a new heart that all of a sudden desires to hear about Christ and take stock of our condition before God. We are sinners. We need a Savior. Who is that Savior? Jesus Christ, the God-man. How do we get to him? And how does he get to us? Well, he comes to us in his mercy by the Spirit through the Word, and he tells us to repent and believe upon him and be saved, be delivered, be forever his. That's breaking up the hard soil. And really, that's the first purpose of preaching, is preaching the gospel, making the person and work for Christ for sinners known, and calling people to repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. That's the first purpose of preaching that was my first concern walking in here in every church. Are you saved? Are you delivered? Has the hard soul of your heart yet been broken up by the Holy Spirit? Are you just going through the motions, putting in your time, enjoying the good life? There's no good life outside of Christ. And in Christ is a very, very good life. And so it is that path is impenetrable. The second soil is called the rocky ground. And you know, if you've ever done any planting at all, we have a lot of farmers here and you could teach me a lot about it. But you know, the seed that comes up quick is not the seed that lasts. There's a lot of rock under it. <laughs> it just appears like it might bear fruit someday, but soon just burns off, gone. And then there's the fourth, the thorny soil. Oh, and don't we have to deal with that in a fallen war of thorns and weeds of all type that devour the good seed in the soil. And so what would otherwise look like good soil is actually laced with thorns and thistles so that when you plant the seed and expect it to give a harvest, all of a sudden it just never happens because the thorns and thistles have just choked it off. I can remember... The summer that my wife and I got married, I was in Jackson, Mississippi, going to Reform Seminary. I lived there as a single guy alone in a house with other guys. And so I bought this little house off campus for my bride and me. And so before, before we got married, I planted a garden in Mississippi in the summertime. All the red clay, <laughs> it's beautiful. I had never had my hands in the dirt like that in my whole life. But some of the professors planted gardens and they knew about planting and I didn't. I planted the garden. And I was so proud of myself. There was tomatoes, and there was zucchini, and there was okra in the garden. That's a Southern thing. You gotta try okra to love okra. And so especially boiling it, it's really good. It kind of goes down no, it's not good. So, but I was proud of myself. So a couple weeks before we got married, I finished up the garden, watered it real well. Kathy and I got married June 23rd, 1978. We flew to Albany, vacation down in Dorset, the house we own now. And yeah, wonderful time, a couple weeks, went back, moved her stuff up from Florida, showed her the house, this little, you know, newlywed bungalow. And then I took her to the garden. Took it three weeks, it had been only three weeks. You couldn't find anything living in that garden. 
What I planted early was washed out by rain, and what stayed was gulfed up by all kinds of insects and thorns. And I just said, well, it was a garden. And she said, well, I married a preacher, not a farmer. <laughs> and I don't think I've planted a garden since. Thorns and thistles in a fallen world. And the same is true of hearing the word of God. You hear it for all it could give tremendous production in our lives, change our lives around, completely transform our culture, retool our habits, and turn us in the direction of living more fully for Jesus. Ah, oh, but those thorns and thistles. And then you have the good soil, four soils. The good soil cleaned out, no weeds, deep enough, you know, so it's not shallow. Not on the path, that's for sure. And you all know what good soil is and what it is not. And good soil, hard to come by. But if you stay at it, weed it, and water it, and God sends nature to do its job, it will produce a harvest. And sometimes an amazing harvest. So it's a simple little illustration or metaphor that Jesus gives here. And his disciples, you know, kind of scratch their head and wonder, well, what do you mean? So Jesus, for one of the only times that we know in the scripture, now he may have done this in private, but it's not recorded in scripture because just a small what Jesus taught is recorded in the gospels. And what he did, or says the scriptures, all the books of the world couldn't hold what Jesus taught and did. So we have a sampling of that, but it's repeated. So on this occasion, Jesus maybe making the point that it's their privilege to understand the parable, the meaning, spiritual significance. He explains it to them. He says, do you not understand the parable, verse 13, how then should you understand all parables? The sower sows the word, so we have no doubt that is in the process of the sower going forth, sowing the seed, he's sowing the word. That is the word of God. That is the word of Christ. He is making the truth of God's word, the gospel and the full complements of his teaching known to the world, whoever's gathered, but especially to those who know him, so that they may for that moment sit at the feet of Jesus and take in his word because his word is better than bread. His word is better than life. His word is life itself. So it is... He tells us that the sower sows the word. And he just explains then the different types of people that hear the same word at the same time and have wildly different results. This could even be the same person at various stages in their life under different conditions, finding the word unprofitable or wildly profitable, depending upon how they receive it. There's a lot of possibilities in this particular parable. So he says, the sower sows the word, and these are the ones on the, along the path where the word is sown, where they hear, they understand, they comprehend, they get it. And they're about to move from getting it to doing something about it whether it's coming to faith in Christ initially, or if they're Christians, moving on the next little step in their sanctification, identifying some sin that they need to repent of and confess so that they can bring greater glory to God. Whatever it may be, they get it. But Jesus says as soon as they get it, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. The word that is sown in them. You know, the most active participant in worship, other than the Holy Spirit, is the devil himself. The most active participant in the preaching of the word is the devil him. Be sure, like a roaring lion, he is here, seeking whom he may devour. Making sure that we get it, but we don't do anything about it. We hear we need Christ, but we don't embrace Christ. 
We hear we need to deal with some issue in our life, but we don't deal with it. He comes to that seed which is heard. They get it, and he comes, and he takes away the word that was sown in them. And so instead of a sermon where you come to the end of the door and say, Pastor, I need to know Christ today. Can't wait any longer. Can you meet with me and help me understand how I come to faith in Christ or pastor? I need to deal with this issue in my life. Whatever it may be, the Holy Spirit has convicted me that I, I'm not right with Christ. I need to deal with it instead of that, oh, good, good sermon. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing to say good sermon. That's okay. Let it go. But that's not the purpose of sermons. The purpose of sermons is to put the whole body of Christ into action. Hearing and doing. Hearing and doing. And between the hearing and doing, it is quite often Satan that comes and takes away the word that is sown in. So it doesn't bear the fruit that it would otherwise bear. The second, of course, Jesus explains the rocky ground. He says that these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who when they hear, when they hear the word of Christ, um, immediately receive it with joy. They're the ones that hear and, and put it into action and they come to the door and they say, Pastor, I need to receive Christ. Let's go in a room. I'll, I'll explain this to you further. And we'll get you started in your walk with Christ. Or they come and they say, Pastor, I need to deal with this issue in my life. Well, can we meet this week and talk about it a little further? We'll, we'll dig down on this and we'll open all this before the Lord and ask him by his grace to, to cleanse you and to help you to live in obedience in a greater way to Jesus. And so they're filled with joy. They, they're just so excited. They're bouncing off the wall. They, they can't wait to put it into action, but, but between that immediate joy, um, they have no root in themselves because of the rocky soil. They endure for a while. And then when tribulation, hardships, difficulty, ordinary life difficulties, or those difficulties that are brought about because you follow Christ. Tribulations or persecution, actual opposition because you're a Christian arises on account of the word, well, immediately they apostatize, they fall away. They fall away. The absent teaching in the church today is the perseverance of the saints. That no one is saved who does not persevere to the end. Jesus said that. Factor that in. You can say all the sinner's prayers in the beginning of your walk with Christ. You can have a blameless, spotless attendance morning and evening, Sunday school without a fail. Have your morning and evening devotions, but he who doesn't persevere to the end shall not be delivered into the kingdom. Your walk can be laced with all kinds of ups and downs and imperfections and seasons of indifference you can go through all kinds of things as a Christian that make you question and wonder. It's not an easy life. It's not a bed of roses. Along with the difficulties of ordinary life, the burden, a joyful burden of denying yourself, taking up your cross and following Jesus. But he who does not fall into the end shall not be saved. And that's precisely what is being told here. They have no root in themselves. They endure for a while. A week, a year, a month, 68 years. But when tribulation and persecution arise on the count of the word immediately, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. And then the moral, the moral situation in which we live today, when people come to Christ, their lives are sometimes morally the very opposite of what a Christian should live. And that's fine. That's where the gospel intersects with the first century world. We can do something with that. But when people profess faith in Christ and they are challenged to bring their life into moral conformity to the will of Christ, that can be hard for them. They might reach a point where they say, well, 
I'm not going to stop living with my boyfriend or girlfriend for the sake of Christ. <laughs> really? Well, can't be a Christian then. What? You're judging me. I'm not judging you. Christ is. I'm just telling you what his judgment is. You can't continue to do this as a Christian or continue to do that as a Christian or continue to do that. And it's a process, so you have to be patient and help them to understand what the will of Christ is. It's not an overnight thing, and you give them as much patience as you can, but gradually they may come to the point where they say, this is just too much. I just wanted Jesus in heaven. I really didn't want the lifestyle of a Christian, of a disciple. Well, why didn't you say that? I wouldn't have wasted all this time. But you see, you never know, right? You never know. They may plow through all of that by the grace of God and be conformed more and more to the image of Christ over the course of many years and persevere to the end. It may not be easy. There may be many ups and downs, fits and starts. And so it is here that the second Rocky ground for all the world looked like it would be profitable. It would produce fruit, but no perseverance. Third is the thorny soil. The thorny soil, and Jesus says, well, and others are the ones that sung among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter and choke the word. Is this just not another way of saying the world, the flesh, and the devil get the best of them. The cares of this world, the world, the flesh, the deceitfulness of riches and desire for other things enter in and choke it off. Christianity, biblical Christianity, is merely discipleship. The discipleship is fairly clearly and narrowly defined in the Bible. Read it, or I'll tell it to you. Every day it begins with affirming your faith in Christ, that he is real, that he's at the right hand of God, that he did come into this world as the God-man, that he did live a perfect life, that he did suffer what I deserved by his crucifixion, he died what I deserved by his death, and he rose again from the dead victorious over all that. Now he's at the right hand of God, and he is gathering his body, the church of which I am a member. And so as I go from this time, I go out to self-consciously Walk with him. Every day my focus is not what would Jesus do, it is what does Jesus command. And so I live to hear him command me through scripture so that I may walk in his ways and be pleasing to him, pleasing to the Father, not turn to the right or to the left. And when I do turn to the right or to the left, I pray his Holy Spirit convicts me immediately so I do not keep going down that path and come back, repent, turn the other way, renew my love for Jesus, ask him to take the reins of my heart and my mind and my life and lead me onward into growth and grace and knowledge in the Lord Jesus Christ. I deny myself, take up my cross and follow him. That's what says forth in scripture. But all the thorns and thistles of life, yeah, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of thinking, if you just had more money and more stuff, you would be somebody. You will never be anybody without Christ. In Christ, you are a child of a living God with an inheritance that is out of this world. Money comes pretty convenient here. Things are necessary, but not inordinate money and not inordinate number of things. Focus on what really is eternal, what really counts. Grandson had a conversation with him yesterday around the lunch table, it was really cute. He said, uh, Papa, he said, when I grow up, I wanna have a mansion. I said, okay. How much do you think a mansion costs? He says, it's about $50,000. I said, well, I think the price has gone up a little bit. We're looking at several million. I said, do you want to pay the taxes on that mansion? No. Want to pay to keep it clean on the inside? No. 
I'm like, pay to keep Vermont woods from just taking it back? Because they will after time. They'll just take it back. That's how the woods are. No. Well, you don't want a mansion. You want a small house that you can afford, paying as little taxes as possible. Have a few things in that house that your kids are going to scrap about or somebody can steal. That's the life. That's the life. And then whatever money, if you get enough money for a mansion, you can give more to the Lord. Get enough money for a mansion. You, can, you don't have to work. You can go serve the hungry soup in the name of Jesus or a salmon or a Big Mac. I don't care. See, godliness with contentment is great gain. But thinking that our life consists of things that we have is just an deception upon deception. It's one of the great deceptions. We find ourselves chasing after the God of materialism even while we profess Christ. And the deceitfulness of that can take our heart completely away from God. The need or perceived need for these things. and the cares of this life, and the pleasures of this world. There are no cares in heaven, but unending pleasures. Think about that. And so that becomes our inheritance. That becomes our focal point. Not only going to heaven, but coming back with Jesus when he returns and when he recedes this earth in his perfect splendor and raises our bodies and glorifies us and we are given the privilege of living in this world with no burdens and pleasure unending. Pleasure unending. So that Jesus continues and then he says, of course, the four soil, those that were sown on the good soil, the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Wow, it's all there. Well, lessons to be drawn, just a few, because I've gone on way too long and I, I'm not going to apologize for that because I'm speaking for Christ here. I'm not going to apologize. First lesson, prepare yourself in mind and heart throughout the week to meet with Jesus and hear him speak to you here. Did you? Prepare yourself in mind and heart throughout the week to meet with Jesus, this special place, at this special time, through this means, to hear him speak to you. You're not hearing a sermon by Pastor Eric or your great pastor not. You're hearing Christ speak. Jesus, in his body, speaking to you and to the body as a whole, but let's just keep it personal. So you need to prepare yourself in mind and heart throughout the week. That imaginary sign over the door when you come in, prepare to hear Jesus speak. I'm not talking about something mystical. I'm talking about something concrete, real, coming through the mouth of Jesus' spokesman, his mouthpiece, his ambassador. Place yourself in the place where Jesus speaks to you, not at home in bed on Sunday morning or wherever worship is called and whenever. All the things Jesus is going to say to you is you should be in that place where I am speaking. That's what he's going to say to you. Get up and go gather with my body in that place where you can be sure that you will hear me speak to you today because my words are better than life. And you need my words. Give serious attention to what is happening when the word of God is preached. Again, serious attention, rapt attention. There's some topics that are more interesting than others, more compelling than others. If a politician stood here and told you the world is coming next week, and there's a nuclear arms race that's gathering, and we're all going to be dead within 10 days, well, that would get your attention, wouldn't it? Depending on whether you believe the politician, what evidence he proved. You'd all be sitting there going, wow, I would too. I might be weeping. I wouldn't be standing up and rejoicing. The word from Christ is no less compelling ostensibly. It must be compelling because it's the word of Christ and therefore it deserves a seriousness that we would give to any urgent message, message about our eternal welfare. Do you know Christ? When you die, are you going to be with him? The message about the perils of sin 
how it creeps up in our life and takes hold of our life and takes us in directions we never thought we could go, even as a professing Christian. How to live positively in this world. What denying yourself, taking up a cross, and following Christ an expression of true faith in Christ really means. Helping us to learn what that means week after week so we, we take on that knowledge and not just hear, but do. Hear and do. Because if we're just hearing and never doing, then the devil has gotten into the works and taken the seed away. Well, the shallowness of our profession of faith in Christ has been revealed. Or we're really people who really have the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and concern about other things as of greater importance than hearing the word of Christ and doing this. I speak to myself as a greater sinner here the one who has the most difficult time listening to his own sermons and the sermons of others. Because there's always a lot going on when the body of Christ gathers. The world, the flesh, and the devil creep in. But we prepare ourselves, we put ourselves in that place, and we give serious attention to the preaching of the word, and we receive and apply the word preached immediately, immediately, without delay. Let us get to it. We've heard the word of Christ, let us get to it. Let us get to it. Amen, let us pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful parable. There's so much to learn. It's it's an iceberg. We just dance on the top of the iceberg here in a shallow fashion this morning. But perhaps enough to remind us of how you speak to us, Lord Jesus, how your Holy Spirit works in us, precious Spirit, how the Father guides us to understand and live out the privilege of being his adopted child of grace. Thank you for the word that is preached here and in every faithful church by every sinful, flawed, yet faithful man who just wants to be the mouthpiece of Christ when the body of Christ gathers. Now we have a task here this morning and tonight and every week to prepare ourselves to hear you speak, to come with that expectation and to receive your word when it is delivered with a ready obedience to hear and to do. And so we pray, Lord, that we will adjust our thinking to that reality. We'll bring ourselves fully under the word of God as it is preached so that we will be part of this process by which you actually produce in us over the course of years a Christ-likeness for the world to see, for our wives and husbands to enjoy, for our families to enjoy, for the body of Christ to enjoy, for the neighbors to enjoy, that we manifest a Christ likeness that is light in an otherwise dark world and salt in an unsavory world. And so continue to work these things in us, we pray, by your mercy, in Jesus' name, amen.